Hi, everyone. Shout outs to Jessica, Darian, Lisa, Alexis, Lady Lemon Zest, of course, Heidi, the show Life Youngs. So I, I don't, I wish I knew your real name there, but so good to see you all. Today, we're going to talk about what you guys were specifically curious about regarding the medication in this vial here called succinethonium or succinylcholine, how it's different than this very similar but different medication that is from the poison arrow dart tree. It's a curare derivative. And what it has to do with your body and why 50% of patients wake up with myalgias all over their body, feeling like they've been hit by a train. Myalgias is just a, the fancy medical term for, feeling like, <clears throat> for muscle aches and cramps and pains. In fact, 50% of patients will have such intense pain after their body, even after minor surgeries, like something just small in their throat or maybe like a cosmetic facial procedure, like a facelift. Patients are willing to pay up to $50 of $2,007. So I don't know, maybe today that's like $150 with inflation, et cetera, et cetera. But clearly there's a problem out here. And the paradox is that the cause of that hit by a train feeling, that myalgia is from muscles that are paralyzed. Why is it that flaccid muscles are going to be sore? You think that if you work muscles out, they get really sore. So we are going to talk about the differences between the two canonical or classic muscle relaxants, the two paralyzing agents, including that really intense one that came from the poison arrow dart, which has been used for hundreds of years by patients. And then we're going to talk about why we use them. And yes, it has to do with what I'm holding here in my hand. And we'll talk about how we can reduce that hit by a train feeling after surgery. So first is succinylcholine, also called succinethonium. It is on the WHO list of essential medications because it is so critical to surgery. So it's what's in this vial here right now. It's usually refrigerated. When we take it out of the refrigerator, it's good for about 14 days. And then you got to toss it. And it's always labeled to the whole bunch. I don't know if you can read it with the camera there, with a whole bunch of warning, paralyzing agent text all over it. You see that there? The other one also has the same thing on here because these are not medications you want to give somebody by accident, like what happened, I believe, at Vanderbilt several years ago where a nurse accidentally gave a curare derivative to an awake patient in the ICU who passed away in this tragic, tragic case, slowly becoming paralyzed and unable to speak and explain what was going on. So anyways, lots of warnings, understandably, on these medication vials. So why is it on the essential list of medications? Well, not for hazing residents in the sucks races that we'll talk about. Sucks is short for succinylcholine. We'll talk about the sucks races uh, near the end. And this WHO essentials list is different than the plant. I, I put it in here because the name is the Strychnus toxifera. They even like hundreds of years ago knew how toxic this plant was. But like I said, succinylcholine is synthetic, but very closely related, and we use them together. I'll explain why. But it's essential because it produces a rapid paralysis that is essential really for two main things in surgery. Two main parts for emergency surgery and starting it and use in pediatrics. So the first question I have to you all, and you're going to get a shout out if you're the first to answer it, why do we need emergency rapid relaxation. Who's going to get the shout out? Um, Cyberdoc, by the way, I'm looking at your uh, thing here. Can one speak in in incomprehensible tongues? I don't know what that means. But here, Elliot got it. Uh, intubation, Elliot Polak. You're right. If we need to do a rapid intubation, we need succinylcholine or there's one alternative we can talk about, but a lot of people here, oh, Rachel is saying spasms. We will talk about laryngospasms as well. So you guys got it. We use the rapid paralysis for what we call rapid sequence inductions. So this is, this is so important. So if you come into this operating room here, let's take a little quick tour here. You come into the table, you get put to sleep with something like propofol. So you're unconscious. We can't connect you to that ventilator 
without first placing a breathing tube. You see that ventilator behind me, right? That's key here because that ventilator will help breathe for you while you are having surgery. Now, the problem is that we have to connect you to that ventilator. We do that by placing this horribly medieval looking contraption into the back of your mouth. There's a light on it so that we can see the glottis and we can see where to place the breathing tube. This is one type of breathing tube called an oral ray. This guy we place into the back of your mouth like this, past the vocal cords where that tip goes, and then we connect this tip here with the adapter. You see this little piece of plastic? That gets connected to the ventilator behind me. That's how we breathe for you, all right? So the problem is that you cannot place this. I mean, look how long this thing is. You can't place this in someone's mouth while they are awake, nor can you place it in someone's mouth if they are unconscious but still able to contract their muscles. This is key because you got to fully relax the vocal cords and all the muscles in the mouth. Otherwise, you won't do what some residents do by accident and push the propofol and make someone unconscious, turn off the lights upstairs, but their spinal cord reflexes are still intact. And they will try to grab your hand as you're trying to put that giant blade into their mouth to place the breathing tube. So you actually need to turn off the lights and paralyze the especially the muscles in the mouth and vocal cords, and really the arms and legs because they can still try to grab your hand from that reflexive spinal cord action. The problem is that if you want to just paralyze a couple of parts of the body, you can't really do that well without paralyzing the rest of the body. So we give these IV to rapidly paralyze the whole body. And of course, you need to make sure the patient is fully asleep. You can only imagine how terrifying it would be to be in an emergency and you're quickly given an IV and medication goes in the IV, but now you're awake but can't move. Super terrifying. We talked about PTSD from anesthesia awareness. Uh, super, super dangerous, right? So if you're going to go to sleep and then be paralyzed, but you have Food in your stomach, this is another big problem. It's why every ventilator has the suction next to it. Um, you see me show these things that go in the back of your mouth to suck everything out. Because if food comes out when you're unconscious and you're paralyzed, you won't be able to cough the food out if it gets near your lungs, near your vocal cords that protect your lungs. And that can cause serious burns, what we call gastric aspiration or pulmonary aspiration, if it's of gastric contents, I should say. So we need to rapidly jam, pardon, not jam, but in some ways jam this tube into your trachea and inflate the balloon you see there. Maybe you don't see it very well, that balloon. So that balloon occludes or covers up the trachea. So if you do vomit food out, it will get stuck on the, on the tube. It won't go into your lungs. So that is why it is so, so important to place this thing in really fast, really flipping fast, so you can cover up your trachea. So that is why succinylcholine is almost like the gold standard. Almost. There's one exception I'll share. Because this will paralyze your body within seconds. And that way, if you are going to vomit something, you only have a couple seconds to do it because we're going to put that tube in super fast. Rocuronium and curare derivatives <clears throat> take a lot longer, typically. It might take minutes to fully paralyze your body so you can place that breathing tube. And those are minutes and minutes that you are vulnerable to aspiration. The one exception I'm saying is that you can give high... It's going to say... <laughs> it's going to say... <laughs> high, darn high doses. <laughs> I'll try to keep it PC. Of very, very high doses, like two times the standard dose of rocuronium can hear rocuronium, you can hear curare in the name of it, <clears throat> to rapidly paralyze someone. That is the other alternative. The problem, not really a problem, but succinylcholine only lasts a couple of minutes in the body, so the patient's paralysis will rapidly wear off. Rocuronium will last hours, and if you give that whopping high dose, it might last even a little bit longer. So Sometimes if a patient needs to be paralyzed for the surgery, rocuronium is a great option. And you can give the high dose at the beginning. 
there's a sub, there are a couple of subtleties here in terms of difficult airways, et cetera, that we won't go into that might influence the choice. There is another application, what Rachel said earlier about spasms. You can have a laryngospasm or your vocal cords literally going like The problem is that if your vocal cords fully close, they cover your trachea. You cannot move air in and out of your trachea into your lungs if your vocal cords are slammed shut. This is why if you are having laryngospasm, meaning spasm of your larynx or your vocal cords, it can be life-threatening because your body will try to breathe, but your vocal cords are shut. So it's like trying to breathe through a straw, but now someone has covered the front of that straw and you're like, <clears throat> and it can be <clears throat> lethal. It can cause what's called Negative pressure pulmonary edema. Try that for an SAT word. It can be life-threatening if that straw is occluded and you're breathing. We typically see it in young men. So the point is that you will give a very small dose of succinylcholine to paralyze, yeah, the whole body, but most importantly, just give a small dose to help the vocal cords also relax. Now, Another time we use this, especially for the vocal cords, are in pediatrics because sometimes we don't place breathing tubes in young babies or young children having surgery. Did you know that? We'll just place the mask over their face and we'll just breathe for them through the ventilator with the mask. So if there's no breathing tube to keep the cords open to prevent laryngospasm, because the, the breathing tube that I showed you earlier, your vocal cords are not strong enough to clamp this shut. They can't clamp this like a straw. They, they're not strong enough to pinch this shut. This will force your vocal cords open. But if you don't have one of these tubes in place, your vocal cords in the middle of the surgery can slam shut, causing that. <laughs> and kids, you don't want to have emergencies in kids. It's very scary, I, I, <laughs> very terrifying. So we always have, in a kid who does not have an IV at least, we have succinylcholine on a needle. Sorry, trigger warning for people I know, right? We have them on a needle, a little bit smaller than this, ready to jab in the kid's arm if we are trying to place the breathing tube and they go into a laryngospasm and we don't have an IV yet to give them IV succinylcholine. We don't give rocuronium in the arm as an injection like that. So this is almost like going back to the poison arrow dart days where the indigenous individuals of South America and Guatemala, et cetera, would dip their needles, their poison arrows, or their arrows into the boiled up concoction of that plant and the bark, et cetera. And they would just line the tip and they would use that to like blow darts at animals to help hit them. They get paralyzed and they can eat them. So we do the same for kids, but we, don't, we obviously don't eat the kids. We help do it to break the laryngospasm should it happen. So these are a couple of important things that you got to know if you're ever wondering about anesthesia, especially for kids. So um, problems, problems is that why, sorry, it took me so long to get here. Why do you feel like a train? Because when succinylcholine goes rapidly into your body, it causes all of your muscles to first spasm and then relax. So for a couple of seconds, your whole body twitches. It's actually kind of scary to see. It looks like a seizure. And that's how you know that the muscle relaxant is in. It is activated because after that spasm of all the muscles, as this is called, it's called polarizing, it is activating them all to the point that they all relax for a couple of like four, five, six minutes. That intense spasming, is like a giant workout. It's like going to the gym for a whole week straight. Your whole body is incredibly sore. It feels like it's been hit by that train. That is different from the other muscle relaxants, but because this muscle relaxant works so fast, we often use it in many surgeries, despite it having that crazy spasm. Now, it's very convenient that these muscle relaxants only paralyze your skeletal muscle, not your heart muscle. Because if your heart muscle was paralyzed, you would be D-E-D -D dead if you're not pumping, unless you're on cardiopulmonary bypass, et cetera. How convenient is it that we have different muscle in our heart and how we have naturally relaxing agents, and I guess non-naturally, because succinylcholine is synthetic, that can specifically target one type of muscle and not the other. It would be hard to do surgery if you didn't have 
specifically a relaxant for skeletal muscle. Now, very briefly, before we talk about how to prevent those spasms, for those of you who are interested, succinylcholine has serious side effects in addition to myalgias. Big one is that it releases a leap ton of potassium into your bloodstream. An average person can handle that potassium, but if you have kidney problems, if you're a young child, uh, if you've had serious burns, these are things that can make that potassium burden much higher and dangerous. So we got to be careful about who we're giving succinylcholine to. It can also cause what's called trismus, which is masseter muscle spasm. It can actually spasm this big muscle here in your jaw. You know, when people are like, oh, that, that spasms, that's serious because now we cannot open the jaw to place the breathing tube. There a couple of techniques to break that, uh, mostly using a high dose of another muscle relaxant. Um, of course, you can have the malignant hyperthermia from succinylcholine. That's a serious one. This can, this is lethal malignant hyperthermia if not treated, if not identified and treated immediately. And then um, in terms of what I wrote as PCD here, pseudocholinesterase deficiency. Some individuals, I've seen it like once in my life, have a uh, deficiency where they cannot metabolize this medication and they will be left paralyzed for hours and hours instead of just a couple of minutes because they don't have the enzyme to break it down. That can be a big problem. Now, I do want to talk to you about the sucks race and how residents in anesthesia are hazed, but just as a very uh, quick shout out before we talk about the hazing and the curing because they're kind of related, is that if you're learning something new, please hit that like button and share what you learn with others. If you like our live streams here, you can always join our uh, exclusive access. The link is below to join our private live streams to ask more of your personalized questions. And please, of course, hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. But going back to curare. So curare is not from the Latin for curing, <laughs> quite the opposite. It comes from, we believe to be a word that was used by the indigenous individuals of Guatemala. Different words in different tribes, but it sounds like wurari, which means, uh, if I recall, uh, uh, pain or poison. That's what it was, poison. So curare kind of sounds like wuari. Now, yeah, is it poison? Yes, because when, in the, when, when the indigenous peoples recognize that, oh, they can boil this bark, and if their arrows are dipped in it, it will paralyze animals that they're hunting. It is difficult to get large enough quantities. So as far as we know, it was not used in modern or in ancient warfare. It was used primarily for hunting prey. but uh, this does harken to our more recent sucks races. So I don't know if, has anyone here heard of sucks races, by the way? I'm going to look at the comments. Shout out, who has heard of sucks races, spelled S-U-C-C? -C? Has anyone heard of sucks races? Um, yeah, sickos. You're right. It is pretty sick because <laughs> they would do a race where they would get a syringe of succinylcholine, they would inject themselves, the residents, and you, like I said, you have maybe a minute before it kicks in or 30 seconds or so, depending on the dose you give. And they would start running as fast as they could. They would see how far can they run before they collapse because of paralysis. And whoever could run the fastest before collapsing would win the sucks race. Here we go. So Peanut here has heard of it. <laughs> I agree. That is a sick, sick race to do with residents. Has it ever actually happened? I don't know. Maybe it's like an urban myth. But it's kind of like what the ancients would use to hunt their prey, only we're doing it on residents. How messed up is that? So uh, it comes from that uh, bark. The curious thing is that you can't eat the curare. <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't get absorbed by your intestines. So it needs to be injected. It has to enter the bloodstream directly, which is why we can't just, you know, chug, chug, chug. But we have to actually give it IV, or in the case of succinylcholine, IM, intramuscular. Now, the cool thing here is that we have this term called pre-curarization. And this is how we can prevent the hit by a train myalgias that succinylcholine gives. It turns out if you give a very small dose of something like rock uranium, like small, small, small dose. That will facilitate the whole body 
becoming relaxed, what's called a non-depolarizing relaxation. This does not cause the myalgias because it does not cause a spasm and then relaxation. It just does relaxation. You give a small dose of this, then we give the full succinylcholine dose. Well, this small dose of this is not enough to facilitate full body relaxation to place that crazy laryngoscope into your mouth for, but it is enough to block the, I got stuck in here. It's enough to block the spasms from the succinylcholine. So pre qrization small dose of this to relax the muscles just enough to prevent the spasm from this leads to you not ever having a significant spasm and a far less likely chance of developing that hit by a train, myalgias afterwards. There's a couple other tricks as well that we do. We might give a bunch of opioids, we might give lidocaine or magnesium to minimize the effect of that intense muscle spasm. But there you have it. That is the full circle from 1500s. <laughs> That's only when white people discovered curare. I'm sure for hundreds of years prior to that, indigenous people have been using it. So full circle from way back when in Central America, South America to the operating room I'm in today. Let us do the q and I'm so excited to answer your questions on this topic that so many of you guys wanted to hear about. Um, straight talk would not mind some curare? Really? I think you would. You might not wake up again. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Um, what is a laryngoscope? Oh, why is a laryngoscope a blade? Is it sharp? It is not so much sharp as it is pointed in a, pointed in a way. This is a Miller blade. I don't really use it unless it's a pediatric case. It's not so much sharp as it is designed to be able to fit in the back of the mouth and lift the epiglottis, which covers the vocal cords, so that you can place the tube through the vocal cords. And it's like notoriously hard to get it back in here. All right, got it? So it's not like it's piercing anything. It should not pierce anything. That would be very, very bad. Uh, Naira says, I'm going to have another upper endoscopy with ultrasound and the GI specialist has to have to meet him before it's being gone. All right. Well, I'm wishing you the best, Naira, for your procedure. Um, necrotic napkin. Sounds pretty nasty, Alexis. I don't know what that is. Jill, you are so welcome. You're so welcome. Hey, the emo surf says, for me, it took a week to stop feeling tired and dizzy memory issues after propofol and reset. Is this common? It is not common for it to be that long, though I don't know what kind of surgery you had. Say minor procedure. Typically, if it's not like brain surgery, open heart surgery, et cetera, the risks of long-term cognitive impairments is quite low. I have seen, I've certainly seen exceptions. You should let your anesthesiologist know so that maybe they can change the dose or change the type of technique that they use in the future. Maybe use a nerve block instead of general anesthesia, for example, to minimize the amount of full-on anesthesia your brain sees. Intubation, says Christy, is too strong for lungs, causes post-surgery pneumonia. Well, it doesn't always cause post-surgery pneumonia. It can. That's why we need to use it judiciously and do everything we can to minimize those associated risks. Um, hey, Patty Jean, thank you so much for that super thanks. It's very kind of you. Um, so I had an endotracheal tube and LMA used in different surgeries. Why? Well, jump in the world. If we don't need to place an endotracheal tube, like the one I showed you, I don't want to use one because it has a bunch of risks associated with it. The myalgias are just one of them because you typically don't need to have all that muscle relaxation to place an LMA. It's not as stimulating as that giant blade going into the back of your mouth. So if a surgery and a patient will be safe to use an LMA, that's what I'm going to use. If the surgery or patient requires an endotracheal tube, that is what I'm going to use. Of course, we want to use the fewest possible interventions for the greatest benefit. And hey, thank you so much, Heidi, for reminding everyone about that. Uh, the Supercast is a great way to keep up with all of my private Zooms and where you can ask more of our questions. I was shaking so much after I woke up from anesthesia. Sam, I'm sorry you had that. That is not from the muscle relaxants, but is likely from the anesthesia coming off, it could be from being cold, it could be from pain, many different reasons for it, probably not from the muscle relaxations. And Jennifer was tested for the MH gene a few years ago, and she does have the gene. Wow. 
you're very rare, Jennifer, and you absolutely need to speak to all of your doctors. You have to tell every single one of them about the MHG. And that is very, very, very serious. I hope that your children are also aware of the risk of them inheriting that gene. Blair is having a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoophorectomy on Wednesday under general. I've been offered a spinal or epidural. I don't know the difference. Well, very, very briefly. First off, I hope everyone here is sending positive vibes for Claire. Can you please do that? Because this is um, a safe surgery, but still, a, you know, a big surgery on your abdomen. A spinal is typically given as a one-time shot. You just give that medication and boom, it's in. And that's it. It'll last for several hours. Um, usually it's not used for uh, laparoscopic cases. So I'm not too sure how they're going to do yours. It sounds like they're not going to do it laparoscopically. But it's typically a one and done. The epidural typically is placed in a catheter, a little flexible nylon tube. It stays near those roots for hours and hours, maybe even days, to provide post-operative pain relief. Those are the main differences. We usually do not use epidurals for the full-on anesthesia, unless it's like for a C-section. Very good question. I hope everyone here is sending you positive vibes. Um, well, gosh, someone else also sent a super thanks. That's so nice of you, Candy. I get twitchy when having to stay still. And I have a uh, breast MRI. What should I do? Well, Candy, I hope that your MRI goes well. If they're looking for, I don't know if it's cancer, or a fibroma, or what it might be. Certainly, please uh, let your doctors know about the twitchiness in terms of if it's anxiety, can something be done to reduce the anxiety? Is this something that needs to be done with maybe sedation and an anesthesiologist? Is there something that's painful in the room? Is there something that's cold in the room? So we want to avoid using sedation for MRIs if possible, but many patients, children and adults, will have a more easy MRI with less movement, which can cause movement artifact or motion artifact and reduce the quality of the MRI. So it's in everyone's best interest for you to be comfortable so there are no twitches. Please feel empowered to speak with your doctor about that, whether it's a radiologist or maybe even calling the MRI center so that you have a plan so you're not left in the unknown here where it can be anxiety provoking. Uh, I'm wishing you the best for that. I hope the result is something that is treatable. Uh, hey, thanks, Green Dragon, for giving Clara the love. Uh, well, Tammy very clearly has a question. After an endoscopy, I woke up with severe neck pain, was told that I quit breathing, and the anesthesiologist did a neck thrust. Is it common? Yeah, pretty common. Not a neck thrust. We call it a chin thrust or a jaw thrust, really. We put our fingers back here, and then we push forward. That motion of pushing forward help stimulate breathing, especially if there is sleep apnea. It's very, very important for anesthesiologists to do this to help keep you alive and breathing and safe if you don't have a breathing tube in place, like the endotracheal tube I just showed or an LMA. Um, LOL, I guess. I'm happy when I'm under anesthesia, says straight, ah, straight talk. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Why have many pain clinics stopped using sedation? Emily, I suspect it has to do with the I word, insurance. Um, Melanie just had her gallbladder removed on Monday. I feel like doo-doo, like I had it done laparoscopic. Gosh, um, I'm sorry that you had that. I know there is this push to have patients go home that same day after surgery. I, I hope that you're having the right support at home. Keep in mind that recovering at home is often much safer than recovering in a hospital with regards to infection risk, having the food that you like, not being woken up by beeping monitors and stuff in the middle of the night. Of course, pain might wake you up, but it is believed that the sooner one can go home, the more safe the recovery will be, assuming the pain is under control. So I hope everyone here is sending you positive vibes for healing as comfortably as possible after your cholecystectomy. Ah, uh, have I tried, have you tried your, have, have you tried yourself propofol? Uh, no, I have not. I have sprayed in my mouth before and it tastes nasty. Ah, uh, nasty. So, uh, Beverly says that it sounds like your mother had an aspiration, vomited, and then 
uh, went into the lungs. If that's the case, Beverly, I'm so sorry that that happened. But I hope that others can learn from your story here to take the fasting precautions to ensure an empty stomach before surgery. Take that seriously because it can make the difference between life and death. I'm so sorry, Beverly, if that is indeed what you are referring to there. Could this affect someone with severe ADHD differently or more? Unlikely, as far as I know, medications used as stimulants for ADHD do not interact appreciably with these types of medications. There are a handful of medications that slightly interact with curares or reflexinocholine. Stimulants are not typically one of them. What else can be used instead of Versed and fentanyl? For lung surgery, well, there's many, many medications. You need to talk to your anesthesiologist about them, but a lot, not the least of which is a thoracic epidural, if that's right for you. Um, FUM versus prop. I don't know what FUM means, but prop probably refers to propofol. Another question. Hey, if you guys are liking the question and answer, like I said, you can join the exclusive access so I can answer your questions in a small private setting over Zoom. The link for that is below. Why do I vomit under general anesthesia, not under MAC? Well, usually general anesthesia has much heavier anesthetics that can lead to nausea, whether it's opioids, whether it's the anesthesia gas. MAC, we usually use propofol in the IV, which is anti-nausea in and of itself, uh, in addition to just there being less anesthesia. Hey, thank you, Dave Nally, for sending her positive vibes. Juana, you are so welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. And hey, I'm happy that you were advocating oral for colonoscopy. So important, especially with the increased incidence of colon cancer in the United States. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, GA is typically used for hysterectomy. That is correct, Alexis. It could be done under a spinal if it's a vaginal hysterectomy, um, but usually we don't do that in the United States. General is just overall more comfortable in many ways. Uh, okay, Ooh, so many questions. Uh, okay, that is bizarre, Siren. I don't even want to repeat that. Moving on. Elizabeth, I have gyne surgery. Wondering about wearing a wig. Well, it's best to not wear a wig. Elizabeth, a lot of, quite, a lot of patients come into the operating room with a wig. They don't tell anyone. But you got to cover your hair so it doesn't fall anywhere into the surgical field, cause a contamination issue. Sometimes as I've moved the patient's head, the wig has come off and I'm like, oh, I didn't know they were wearing a wig. Because sometimes we have to position you in different positions to move your head around. Best to not wear a wig. I, I hear you on the self-consciousness part, but certainly uh, you'll be wearing something over your head to start with. And we see a lot of things that I don't want to say are embarrassing or not embarrassing. I don't want to put judgment onto that, but can certainly induce a tremendous amount of self-consciousness. So I hear you on that. I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing, and I hope that you feel empowered to talk with your doctor about that. Um, there should be no myalgia with just sedation. Well, typically, no, so you're not getting the paralyzing agents. So unless there's another reason for the myalgia, like the surgery itself causing soreness, typically, no. Um, there's... Depression affect the way you go under and wake up. We'll end with this because it's so important. It can. It's your mental health matters. In this operating room, as much as outside the operating room, we can chemically force your body into submission with these medications, with the ventilator behind me, with the breathing tube that I showed you guys. But the body keeps score. We can artificially put your body into a certain mental state or physical state but it can cause long-term consequences. It can affect you for the rest of your life potentially, which is why appreciating just how powerful your mindset is before you go into the operating room, whether that mindset is influencing your depression, the ruminations and perseverations of the past or future, which we call anxiety, PTSD, addictions, whether it's from the medications you're taking for these conditions or just because the conditions affect on your central nervous system itself. For multiple reasons, your mental health is paramount, and you need to feel empowered to advocate for yourself with your doctors to help make sure that this environment is optimized and tuned to you and your mental health as much as it possibly can be. That is the safest way to go through surgery, even in the modern day. With that said, I wish everyone an awesome rest of the day. Please remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. If you haven't already, 
hit that like button, show some love, and share what you've learned with others to help them advocate for themselves in the broken healthcare system that we all have to work in. Until next time.